Homecoming, Chapter 11, Part 2 Dicey awoke to a thick black silence. She slipped out of bed and went to the window. Night smothered the land. A dark wind blew clouds across the face of the moon and over the little stars. This kind of wind blew in clear weather, so tomorrow would be a good day to begin travelling again. They had only seven dollars left, but they had bicycles now, and Dicey had her jackknife and her map. What they didn't have was any place to go. Back to Bridgeport, Dicey supposed, the long way back. Will couldn't help them. They couldn't live for the circus. James had to go to school and so did Maybeth, but for different reasons. Could they hide out? Could they find the circus again and travel south and then pitch a permanent camp somewhere? Dicey thought they could manage that. She could lie to any school officials. She'd be 18 in five years. She could say they lived back in the hills with their mamma and their mamma couldn't come in because she was working the farm. Nobody would care enough to question, not as long as they showed up in school. There was a boy Dicey knew in Provincetown who ran away from home and he just kept on coming to school and nobody knew, not for months. The plan was possible, Dicey thought, only she couldn't get excited about it. Having some place in mind that you were travelling to was different from not having any place. But it was a plan. She'd asked James what he thought. He might think they should go back to Bridgeport, and he might be right. One way or the other, north or south, they'd be moving on. OK, Dice said to herself. OK, that's what we'll do. She thought she'd go back to bed and sleep some more if she could get to sleep again. She took a last look, seeing in her mind's eye the things she couldn't really see, the pines and the fields, the marshes and the bay beyond, the barn that held the sailboat like a buried treasure in its dark belly. Dicey belonged here. She belonged here, yet she was being blown away. Well, it wasn't her house, that was true. It was their grandmother's house and they were not welcome. They would stay together, at least that. She could go along with Cousin Eunice and everything except about that. She wouldn't agree to sending Sammy or Maybeth away. She'd say that right away. Darcy noticed a yellow light flowing onto the lawn below the porch. Had somebody left the kitchen light on? She went downstairs to turn it off. Her grandmother sat at the kitchen table wearing an old striped cotton bathrobe. She had a cup of tea before her and a pad of paper on which she was writing. Her hair was all in tousled curls. She looked up at Dicey when Dicey came in. I couldn't sleep so I'm writing to that silly woman Eunice, she said. Dicey stared. Her grandmother was pretty. Her face had delicate straight bones and those wide dark eyes. What are you staring at, girl? You. You're pretty. I never noticed, Dicey said. Never mind. I saw the light from my window. I didn't know anyone was here. I'm sorry. Sit down, her grandmother said. Get a glass of milk first. I wondered who'd taken that room when I heard you up there. Get your milk and sit. I've got something I should say to you. Dicey poured herself a glass of milk and sat down. She'd never really looked at her grandmother before, just at the enemy she had to trick just at her bare feet. It's OK, Dicey said. I'm not going to argue about staying. Wouldn't do you any good, her grandmother said. She put the cap on the pen and twisted it shut, but I should apologise for yelling at you. Her grandmother's mouth twisted in a sudden smile. That Will seems a good man. Could you go to him? Would you rather do that than go back to this woman? I was thinking about that, Dicey said. I was going to ask James what he thought. He's the one, really. He should go to school. Well, Maybeth should too. Maybeth's not retarded, her grandmother said. I know that. She is slow, though. Not as slow as she seems in school, but... Why go over this again? There was a lady, a nun in Bridgeport. She might help Maybeth. Her grandmother sipped at her cup of tea and Dicey drank at her milk. I want to explain, Dicey's grandmother said. I've never explained before to anyone, but I have to now. Because in a way, I do want to keep you here, but I can't. Dicey nodded. She could feel how true that was. Her grandmother went on speaking. I'm old, not very old yet, but getting older. You can't tell what will happen. What if I feel sick, for instance, and I've very little money? When my husband died, he left some insurance, enough to live on if I live carefully. I don't mind that, 
but it's expensive with children. She smiled again. I'm already going to have to die a month sooner than I planned with the food this week. That's crazy, Dicey said. It's a joke, girl, her grandmother said. I mean to explain that I don't have the money. Will said Social Security would give me money for you, but I never took charity. Mama wouldn't either. That's why she was taking us to Aunt Scylla's house, Dicey said. I understand about that, she said. There's more too, her grandmother said. I don't know whether you can understand this now, but if not now, there's always later. I was married for 38 years and my husband died just these four years ago. Until then, until he died, when you marry someone you make promises. I kept those promises, love and honour and obey. Even when I didn't want to, I kept them. I kept quiet when I had things to say. I always went his way. That's hard to believe, Dicey said. It is, isn't it? Since he died, I've been different. It took a while, but it's my own life I'm living now. I had a hard time getting it. I don't want to give it up. No lies, no pretending, no standing back quiet when I want to fight. Dicey thought of Cousin Eunice. She couldn't picture her grandmother like Cousin Eunice. It would be awful if her grandmother was like that. It's okay, Dicey said. I understand. That's more than your mamma could, her grandmother said. She felt sorry for me. Do you know that? No, she never talked about you, except to Sammy and he couldn't remember. Your mamma stuck around here a long time just because she felt sorry for me. I was glad when she began seeing Francis. He was handsome and cheerful. I thought maybe she'll be happy, maybe she'll steady him down. But do you know what I said to her just before she left this house? She was 21 then and her father couldn't stop her. I said, we don't want to hear anything from you until we hear that you've been married. He was right beside me then and I knew it was what he would say. So I was the one to say it because I didn't want her thinking I wouldn't stand by him. I had to stand by him. He was my husband. Do you know what she said? She said, I'll never get married. She wasn't angry. She never fought, not your mother. She was gentle like Maybeth. Your father wasn't a fighter either. I don't know where you get it from because you are. Dicey knew where she got it from, but she had a more urgent question. Why didn't Mama want to get married? She had seen what happens. She didn't want to give her word like I did. We keep our promises, we Tillemans. We keep them hard. But I don't understand. Can't you love somebody and fight with them? I fight with Sammy and with James. I make Maybeth do things she's scared to do. But that's because I love them. If I didn't love them, I wouldn't bother. And they fight back, like James. Walking out here instead of waiting, that's fighting back. It was okay, too, because it was his own decision. I want him to make his own decisions. Didn't you love Mama? Oh, yes, I loved my children. I had a lot of love to give in those days, to my husband, too. But it got turned around. I got turned around. I let myself get turned around. Her grandmother waved her hand vaguely to brush away the memories like you brush away cobwebs. And it's all gone now, and they're all gone now. So it's past. Dicey finished her milk. Will you tell them about Mama not marrying? I lied to them about it. It was better then to lie. Now it isn't, at least. I don't think so. I'll tell them if you won't, but if you would, they'd understand better. Maybe. Maybe I'll try. I saw a picture of you when you were little, Dicey said. Cousin Eunice had one. You looked angry. I was angry most of my life, her grandmother said. Not any more, if you can believe that. Just crazy now, and that's an improvement. Not really crazy, eccentric. But those years, morning to night, all that anger, you can choke swallowing back anger. And it still sneaks out in little ways. And everybody knows, although nobody says anything. So they left, every one. They couldn't stay here. All of my children, they ran as fast and as far as they could. My Sammy, he died of it, and that was hard. Hard. And your poor mamma. They shamed me, and I shamed myself. She chewed on her lip. Then she looked Dicey full in the eyes and said, I failed them. I let them go. I told them to go. There were times I could have killed them. He'd sit chewing, and the anger and shame were sitting in the table right with us. Chew and swallow, so sure he was right. But I'd promised him, and he didn't know why they each left. I did. So I'm responsible. 
I won't have that responsibility again not to fail again. Are you sure you'd fail? Darcy asked in a low voice. We can't stay here, I know. Don't worry about that. But I don't think you'd fail us. We had Mama and I wouldn't let those things happen. That was true, even though her grandmother, her grandmother had this big house and what remained of the farm to keep her fed. Her grandmother nodded. You've got determination, she said. Mama said it was in my blood, Dicey answered. I never knew what she meant before. Your mama was a kind child, her grandmother said, but she never forgave her father. Did you? Dicey asked. No, yes. Somehow this made sense to Dicey. It let her know that she would be all right and her family would be all right. They wouldn't be children forever. They didn't have to have a place, they just had to have themselves. She yawned, fighting it off and losing. You'd better get back to bed. I'll finish this letter to that Eunice now. I'll try to tell her about Maybeth, but she's such a silly woman. I doubt she's got two ounces of common sense rattling around in her head. Your cousin doesn't care much for you. This doesn't surprise Dicey. That's okay, she said. Well, I do, her grandmother said. I care for all of you. Now get to bed. I'll wash out your glass. Scat. Dicey ran upstairs. She ran into her bed and pulled the covers up over her head. Cousin Eunice didn't want them, but she would take them in. Her grandmother wanted them, but wouldn't let them stay. And they, she, James, Maybeth and Sammy, they were the losers. Dicey cried to sleep. She couldn't stop. She tried, but she couldn't. She didn't know if she was crying for her family or herself or for her grandmother or for all of them, all the Tillemans, Mama too, lost up in Massachusetts and Bullet lost in Vietnam. They were all lost. Dicey promised herself this was the last time she'd cry ever and wept until her eyes were swollen shut and she slept. Sunlight was pouring over the house and yard and through the windows when Dicey awoke the next morning. She pulled on shorts and a shirt and looked into three empty bedrooms before she came downstairs. Her grandmother was alone in the kitchen. She was kneading dough. What's that? Dicey asked. Bread. I haven't made it for years. You slept late. Dicey nodded without apologising. She looked at her grandmother. She had grey splotches under her eyes and the fine wrinkles that came out from the edges of her eyes and her mouth seemed deeper this morning. This was not quite the same woman Dicey had talked with in the dead of night, but this was not a different woman either. Dicey poured herself a glass of milk and took an apple from the bowl of fruit. She stood by the sink drinking and chewing and watching her grandmother knead the pale dough. Push, pull, slap, push, pull. Her grandmother leaned into the dough with her shoulders but handled it gently at the same time. Her grandmother was contradictory. Except for the fatigue, her grandmother looked perfectly ordinary this morning. Only now Darcy knew better. There was a warm feeling in her stomach as if she had swallowed sunshine. At least now everything was settled. She wasn't battling any more. <clears throat> she liked her grandmother, her mama's mother. She liked her all prickly and contrary. She liked the way her grandmother said one thing and then the opposite because it made sense to Darcy, the same kind of sense Dicey made to herself. She liked the way the woman had watched Sammy roll naked in the grass and she liked her bare feet. This was a good way to feel to say goodbye. We'll be moving on today, Dicey said. I wanted to thank you for letting us stay so long. Not today you won't, her grandmother said. You can't just bolt off like that. You've done enough running away, don't you think? Dicey couldn't see her face, but her voice sounded pleasant enough. I've written to your cousin. We have to wait and see what she answers. You'll stay here until then. I'll mail the letter Tuesday. We're going to town Tuesday for food and talk to the people at the school. What grade are you in? Going into eight, Dicey said. But why? Do you know how long it'll take that dithering woman to get advice from all the people she talks to and arrange to come and get you? You may, but I don't. Children should be in school. School starts Tuesday, or so James tells me, and I have no reason to disbelieve him. Those bikes will give some trouble. <clears throat> I have no idea how to ship bicycles, and I won't have them here rusting in the barn. <clears throat> what if we won't, don't want to go back to Bridgeport, Dicey asked. 
First, we find out if you can. For today, while the bread is rising, we might go take a look at Jane's Island. It's all marsh and you can land there. Don't know why they call it an island. Where are the little kids? Dicey asked. Down by the dock, bailing out the boat. They have all agreed. They want to see the island. Her hand slapped at the bread. She poked at it with a finger, then began kneading it again. I told them what she wanted me to. Sammy, she shook her head and slapped the dough down on the table. He said I was lying and he said he didn't care. Then he said he was sorry he knew I wasn't lying, but still didn't care. Maybeth didn't say a word, but James, he told Sammy he did care and if it was what your mama wanted, then that was okay with him because she might have been crazy in some ways, but she was never crazy when it came to loving her kids. I asked him where he got ideas like that and he looked me straight in the eye and said, from books. She laughed briefly. Yes, I told them. I also told them they ought to think twice before they held that lie against you. Dicey ran down to the dock. The bay was lively, with crisp top blue waves under a steady breeze. Her family had bailed out the boat and now they were swimming. What's going on, James? Dicey called. He swam over to her. I don't know, Dicey. We'll be here a little longer, that's all I know. We're going to an island, Sammy called. It's okay about Mama. She didn't want to get married, did you know? Dicey nodded. They motored over to the stretch of marshland just off the town shore. There they dropped an anchor on the bay side. Birds lived on Jane's Island, but nothing else could. One snowy heron soared down, folding its wings in the last minute, returned to its nest deep in the marsh grass. A few ducks wandered along the muddy shore, in and out of the tall grasses. They saw flocks of gulls gossiping, bickering, bobbing on the waves, flying in noisy, noisy swarms. Their grandmother had packed a bag of fruit and some cold crab left over from yesterday's lunch. As they ate, she asked them about their travellings, so James and Dicey took turns telling her. Well, she kept saying, and that was a piece of luck. She didn't ask them about Bridgeport. Back at the farm, Dicey took Sammy to the barn to begin patching, while James and Maybeth rode their bikes up and down the driveway. You don't have to do that, their grandmother said to Dicey. I know, she said. The patched place showed up bleak against the wasted pink paint of the barn. They would hold, Dicey knew. They'd been nailed into place firmly and the edges were sealed against the weather. If she'd had time, she would have liked to paint the whole barn, just so there would be something here to say. Dicey Tillerman stayed here a while and she made a difference. Dicey figured they had a week, maybe two, before they had to go back to Bridgeport, to the little house and the fussing and fretting. She planned to enjoy the time and not worry about the future. Her grandmother seemed to feel the same way. It was as if now everything was decided they could both relax. So they passed two quiet days, hammering, bike riding, except Sammy, swimming, weeding, picking, fixing the mailbox, just living together. In the evenings, they went onto the back porch or into the living room. Their grandmother found an old checkers set somewhere deep in a closet. Maybeth picked out tunes on the piano. Some of the songs they sang, the songs Mama had sung, their grandmother knew. Some of them she had to learn, and she wasn't, wasn't very good at it. Yet the feelings in the air were not all placid. Dicey disagreed with her grandmother whenever she thought her grandmother was being unfair. Um, she would say, because they still had no name to call their grandmother. Cousin Eunice tried to do her best. Sure, she's silly, but that's not her fault, is it? Well, whose fault is it then? Their grandmother would answer sharply. If it's not her own fault for what she's like, I'd like to know whose fault it is. OK, Dicey would say, giving ground because privately she thought her grandmother was right. But she's not bad. Who mentioned bad, their grandmother would say. James, did I? Maybeth, did I say bad? I said silly, and I meant silly. Their grandmother would rush on before they could answer, and there's an end to it. Dicey is the one who said silly, James would say. Aha, their grandmother would say, I told you, Dicey, it's all your fault. Then Dicey would swallow the disappointment and enjoy the temporary haven. For these two days, she stopped thinking about ahead. She learned how to put the bandage on Maybeth's arm. 
which Maybeth said was better, but their grandmother said she'd be supported for two full weeks, especially since Maybeth was riding her bike so much. They took one long ride, James and Dicey and Maybeth. They saw several farmhouses. Some of them had cows and horses. All of them had chickens. Most of them had fields of corn and tomatoes. Dicey made herself stop thinking about the sailboat in her grandmother's barn. That was to have been the prize, her prize, if they'd stayed. She wouldn't go near it now. She knew that if she did, she'd begin planning again, and she'd get it down to the water somehow. Once the boat was in the water, they could take it away and sail south and hide. But they didn't have any place left to go to. She had been beaten this time, down to her bones beaten. She had fought her hardest and her smartest, and she'd lost. She could take that, and she could understand the whys of it, but not if the boat was in the water, and the sails fitted to the mast, and the wind blowing little clouds across the sky. So she shut the sailboat out of her mind, just as she shut out hoping and caring, and the disappointment that waited for her to relax her guard, so it could leap out and get its teeth into her. She just lived through the hours, taking them as they came, knowing they would never come again.